Hey everybody, this is Perch, and I'm here with Joe Corallo. How you doing? I'm all right. How are you? I'm doing good. And, and it's uh, we do these retrospectives. We've done some really long ones. People seem to enjoy them. Yeah, I, you know, I, uh, they're fun for us. Yeah, no, I I, I love it. And uh, you know, but but this time, uh, since we've been doing a lot of like runs and things like that, we were we thought, why don't we do just like a a, a, a one issue retrospective? Exactly. And, and, and one that it's, is, was a big issue, but I don't think, I don't know. I don't hear it come up very often, um, but it's a, it's a big one. Yeah. Um, you know, this is, I don't want to overhype it, but, uh, right on the cover, it's, uh, possibly the greatest annual of all time. That's right. That's right. It does say that. Um, and it, it it's at least hinting that it, it very well could be. So this is, this is Fantastic Four number three, annual number three. It's a special king-sized uh, annual, uh, 1965, and it features a, a huge moment that has actually lasted it is all this time. Yeah, it's um, the sensational The Wedding of Sue and Reed. <laughs> That's right. Featuring the world's most colossal collection of costumed characters, crazily cavorting and capering in continual combat <laughs> ah stan lee you gotta you gotta love it <laughs> yeah and um y- you know some of the best parts about the the cover of of this issue is um it features a lot of people who aren't actually in it <laughs> that's true yeah i i was noticing now this comic has a ton of uh, it, it has a lot in there it it yeah. has but um i can't help but notice there are characters who never show up <laughs> yeah, um, uh, the Hulk doesn't show up. The leader, Medusa, uh, Submariner, um, yeah. you know, uh, Kid Cult. Um, I think the uh, unicorn's on there. I don't remember him. I think so. Uh, Dragon Man's on there. He's not in it. Um, Scarlet yeah. Witch, also not in it. Um, right. Loki is also not in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so many people not in this. Um, uh, Nick Fury is on it twice. Yeah, that's as a as a younger and older version, I think, kind of too. Yes, yes. you know, um, one <laughs> of the the frightful four is on here. Uh, yeah. The the one that was it the trapster? I think the trapster's on here. Yeah, I see the. Uh, Hold on here with a full blown. We got a, a Nazi symbol sighting right on the cover. Yeah, um, yeah, full blown Nazis. Ooh, um, yeah. You know, we we got that. So yeah, it's uh, a lot of characters that are not in this. Um, <laughs> God, and then um, th- this uh, king size annual also features a complete reprint of uh, you know uh, issue number one. Right. Uh, not issue number one, issue number six. It's the Submariner Doom team up. Yes, that's right. You know, and uh, which which is a great issue. And yeah. then it's and then they also reprint uh, issue eleven, one of the worst issues they ever put out with the Impossible Man. <laughs> that's right. I mean, a lot of I, I think people have memories of the Impossible Man from the eighties, where it was. I mean, it's always comic relief stories, but it's done a little bit better, I think, uh, with with the X Men and and some other things, but. Uh, this was yeah, that was a terrible issue. I'm not sure why. I, I'm unclear why. I get why they want Submariner and, and Doctor Doom, but yeah, but I, um, I double checked because for whatever reason, Roy Thomas was a big fan of the Impossible Man. <laughs> okay, um, he wrote in. I, I think it was published in the letters column for Fantastic Four number fifteen. Um, he wrote a long letter, and in it, he talked about how much he really liked the Impossible Man. Mm-hmm. And I checked, I double checked when, when Roy Thomas started at Marvel and he started like right around this issue. So it would have been too, it would have, he started too late to have, I think had input on, on which issue was being reprinted. But, um, but luckily uh, for everyone, uh, the impossible man didn't show up again for like over a hundred more issues. Yeah. Yeah. We got, I mean, at least a decade, right? I mean, it was, like, oh, it was like over a decade. I think, yeah. I think it was uh issue one seventy six. I, I think was when we got the impossible man coming back. Yeah. I'm not clear. Well, who knows what they were doing back in those days, but yeah, I, <laughs> this, this is officially the big team. This is Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Um, 
And and here we are seeing, I think, some of the danger of uh, Vince Coletta. I think. Yeah, no, this is some of uh, this is subpar even for Vince. Yeah, it, it is. It's weird because there there's clearly pages that had better work and less work. But there's some like if you're a big Jack Kirby fan, um, there there's some torture being done to Kirby. I think in these pages. Oh yeah, no, uh, Kirby's work gets. Uh, noticeably ripped apart in, in multiple points in in this issue. But yeah. uh but it's it's referred to, despite the fact that this wedding's happening, the issue is uh the story rather is a bed limit, the Baxter building. Well, I mean in fairness, that could that could be a wedding. Um <laughs> it, it could be. But um it, yeah. you know, and for whatever reason, Doctor Doom in Latveria uh has a copy of the uh Daily Press from that day. Yes. I love the simplicity of the headlines of uh, today's today. Like it is, it is the big news. The front page news is Reed and Sue getting married and today's the day. And I like this. I like this picture of doom just kind of glowering over this page as well. Yeah. Well, it's such like a fourth wall breaking moment. Cause he's not showing the, the, the paper to anyone. He doesn't even have like a minion. Right. Um, when we cut to the next page, he he was just giving us the benefit of the doubt and showing us. Right. <laughs> the it get to us. Yeah. You know, and then he uh, proceeds to tear it apart, despite the fact that he must have paid a fortune to have that like air delivered to Latveria that day. I mean, yeah. How did how could he have even gotten? I mean, you, you've got to picture some Doctor Doom technology of being able to just teleport the page somehow into his hands that that ruined the economy of Lavernia just right there. It seems our little friend has helped me more than I could have dreamed. I don't need to stop this mission now. Now no one will capture Colossus before me, and they can die in space. <laughs> yeah, so then um you know, Doom decides that um, he's going to use his emotion charger uh, device, which basically, uh, yeah, basically Twitter. He he basically turns to Twitter to piss everybody off. Yeah, uh, he he goes on. You know, he uses the social media device to um, <laughs> and 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 here's where um, you know Kirby's doing his best. Is like Stan is like phoning it in like nobody's business he just oh, yeah. has like dr doom go like i'm gonna pull a lever that's gonna make all the villains mad at the fantastic four yeah i, I love this plot is is uh, absurd I mean, like the the super the super powered foes are already evil and, and nasty and everything else but this is just gonna make them it's a high frequency emotion charger that will fan the flames of hatred in the heart of every evil menace in existence which yeah. it is Twitter, basically. That that is a lot, and then um, that's that's followed by um, what was it? Um, we we go down to a shout out to the Fantastic Four fan club Brooklyn chapter. Oh yeah, yep. And um, every, all the news, uh, yeah. all the news stations are there waiting to see uh, Reed and Sue, I guess. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Sue and Reed, congratulations on your wedding! Yep. Then we start with the gratuitous cameos. Yes, and, and we know they're gratuitous because even like Stan Lee points out, if you're a name dropper, you're really going to have a ball now. Ready? Here we go. And what's yep. funny is actually he only he says that, but then there's only two panels where they really drop names before we move to the Puppet Master. Yeah, and um, and one of those is uh, Tony Stark dressed in no way that anyone recognizes Tony Stark now with a giant <laughs> like top hat. He's the Monopoly uh, guy. That's he basically. Looks- yeah, he looks like the Monopoly guy, and uh, and he just has the worst dialogue. I thought I'd get it out of mothballs for this occasion, like talking about his stupid hat. Yep. And, uh, God, and then right after that, they we get this is where the name dropping gets crazy. We get we get Patsy Walker, we yep. get Millie the model, and then we get uh, an Irving Forbush name drop. Yeah, 
we're, we're, we're digging deep right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, Irving Forbush was like a joke that it was just like a running gag in all like the letters columns. Like Stan was always referring to Irving Forbush. He was like, um, I think he was what, like a fictional employee at Marvel that was based on a real employee, but they called him Irving Forbush. Like, yeah, it was meant to be kind of a, a, a nod to their own company, but uh, I, I always felt it amused Stan a lot more than anyone else. Um, yes. I, I think that's a fairly safe bet. Yeah. And uh, and for all you kids out there listening who, who don't know who Millie the Model is, she was starring in like one of the longest running comedy magazines that, that Marvel did. Um, I, I think it ran for like 50 years. It was something like ridiculous. Yep. And... Um, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, at least from like the forties to like the eighties. Um, but, um, they moved, uh, Millie, the model into, um, at the time in the eighties, Marvel's, uh, YA imprint, uh, star comics. Mm -hmm. Um, so just so you know, if you're not dead inside already, <laughs> ev every single decision that people are talking about and are acting as this is a new innovative thing was done years ago. Everyone forgets and acts like it never happened, and it makes me miserable. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's just like you guys did a YA imprint almost yep. forty years ago. I, there, there are a lot fewer new ideas than than people think. Um, and I mean, and speaking of which, into this entire issue, which as we get into it, um, it, it if this was done today, this idea of this big crossover, um, how many issues would this event be? This, I, I mean, we wouldn't have, I, I'm going to say about eight easy, yeah. and that's not including the tie-ins, but um, the whole beginning of, of Dr. Doom's plan would have just been one issue. Yeah, that was one issue just with Doom, and then like the paparazzi appearing and kind of this, the shenanigans with the puppet master who's controlling somebody, that would have been our issue too. Yes. Yeah. No. Ab absolutely. But, but yeah, the puppet master comes back and uh, he had already sworn off uh, attacking uh, the Fantastic Four for the sake of his stepdaughter. But right. um, he it, the dialogue is written in a way with like the thought bubbles of like, I don't know why I, I feel compelled to like murder the Fantastic Four. But here I am. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and then um, and then we skip to random guy approaching thing to murder him. Yeah, I, I like <laughs> I like how this this whole sequence go down, and then you, Nick Fury and uh, and his crew put, do short work of that. But I mean, it, it's like I, I love they had this thing like we were scanning everybody's brain and saw two brain waves. Someone was controlling him, which is I mean that that's some that's some quick thinking by Fury here. Yeah, um, it seems like the kind of thing that, uh, you know, Jack just drew something and Stan was like, ah, I don't know, brainwave scanner. I mean, even the thing looks a little confused here. I mean, but but uh, Nick Fury went and got a printed card uh, that he could show that have these brainwaves and he was holding them backwards. Um, anyway, sorry, there's there's so many logistical things here. No, that's that's fine. And then on the next page, uh, they thoroughly confuse the audience by having Puppet Master and Professor X show up on the same page when they're drawn exactly the same. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, Professor X's eyebrows slightly curve up. So that's yeah, weird. his eyebrows. He looks like a giant ant or something. It's yeah, he did really weird like a giant man thing or Namor. Uh, yeah, and and we. We see that the uh, the red ghost is coming with his monkeys, which is always a good time. But meanwhile, we also get a very strange mole man attack. Uh, yeah, he he drills up through the lobby. Um, he's had some work done too. By the yeah, way. he he does. His hair looks really nice. It's a bright red. Yeah, <laughs> it's um you know, but um the mole man comes to attack the X Men, I guess. <laughs> It's yeah, the X Men are just hanging out in uh, which which is interesting because in the in the uh, astonishing book where they kind of talk about moving in on the the Fantastic Four's territory, but here we see that the X Men had a long time rivalry with the Mole Man. Apparently, yeah, uh, apparently it goes back a long way. But um, I don't know why the X Men were the only ones in the lobby. Yeah, they're That's just hanging out with the thing, and and they they I, I love they basically uh, you know they they have this quick battle and then Iceman corks up a hole. They basically puts them in the hole and then Iceman corks it up and that's the end of that threat. So 
Yeah, because sure. um, none of the mole men, uh, you know, lackeys can figure out how to dig. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's it's very weird. Uh, yeah, like the and uh, the way they cork them, it's like they put all this ice, and then he's just like, uh, you, you know, it's uh, what there the that solid mass of ice will seal the opening and push them steadily down as it keeps melting, and it's like. Is that how it works? That's not. That's not how water really works. Uh, no. I, I mean, you, you, or are you just murdering them? I mean, I can't tell exactly. You're either you're, killing them, or as it melts, they'll just break through it. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're you're killing them, or you're going to get them wet. That's that's basically the two options we've got here. Uh, the thing is concerned about his suit, of course, because uh, you know that that's the real tragedy we've got here. After it's shown him kind of balling up a bunch of these emollients and rolling them into the hole. Um. Yeah. And then it's this whole internal conflict he's having of like, I don't want a bug read on his wedding day that everyone's being butchered in the lobby. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you like, don't want to spoil the day. Yeah. You know, it's just like, I'd rather he not know his friends are getting murdered right before his, his wedding. I, I, he gets up and he hears screams though. And he just breaks down the door and we see that, uh, I mean, what, what do we see here? We see basically that Alicia and Sue are are hiding in a shield. Yeah, they're in a shield because the Red Ghost has uh, come. One of the single worst, uh, <laughs> schlubbiest, not even trying Fantastic Four villains. If you don't know the Red Ghost, he he doesn't even try. He needs a haircut. He just wears like a a green sort of nasty looking like jumpsuit and he's just like i got apes yeah exactly he's got three magic irradiated apes and then he has kitty pride powers kind of it's it's very sad uh, but he's he's even though the ape has a hold of reed's arm and that's apparently threatening dr strange shows up and just blasts him into another dimension and they go soaring out into space and that's it Doctor Strange appears to murder a bunch of people. <laughs> yes. He murders the Red Ghost and three apes that have sentience and uh, and a conscious. And, and Reed and Doctor Strange just shake hands. And Reed's just like, you know, we're mighty grateful to you, my friend. I won't forget this. Uh, you <laughs> evaded me in the past, Reed. Or, you know, uh, Richard. And it's just like, you just murdered them. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it it's uh, I mean, they're just they're still uh, wedding or no wedding. We're on alert. And, uh, you know, Sue's very helpless in this. Um, but, you know, they're, they're they they sense danger and they there is danger because we get then a little montage of see the Mandarin. We get the Black Knight, Kang, uh, the Grey Gargoyle, um, uh, basically. Yeah. And, and just they're all coming in uh, to. To, to cause some cause some damage yeah and god is that the inventor I, i'm trying to think who made the stupid rock monster the mad thinker right mad thinker that's it yeah, yeah. mad thinker and yeah. um a, another classic fantastic four <laughs> um you know but uh and, and while dr doom is just like watching it all on his tv because uh, uh i guess uh he can't be bothered yeah, he can't he he can't be bothered to stop the uh, Fantastic Four on on Reed and Sue's wedding day. It's uh, I mean it's it's fun. and the Super Squirrel appears and this brings Thor into the mix and it's it just at this point the comic is in just veering toward a, bla a battle royale. I mean it. it oh yeah, it, yeah. Uh, Thor uh, stops himself from hitting the ground uh, with his hammer by catching onto a building because we all know that if Thor hit the ground he'd get hurt <laughs> yeah what is this i'll break my fall by catching my hammer on this roof edge why <laughs> what is why is that a concern to anyone um especially thor i mean if it was like i don't want to splatter down in this crowd and, and murder some people with my falling body i get it but anyway we get a whole panel to him catching himself on the roof ledge and then proceeding to just fuck up super scrolls uh ship here 
Yes. And, um, and then we cut to them uh, getting ready for the, the wedding uh, thing, Reed, Sue. And then um, their lawyer, um, who, you guessed it, Matt Murdock shows up. Yep. And um, as our lawyer, would you tell the guests there will be a slight delay? <laughs> yeah, I love that line. Like, wh- why, why are you sending your lawyer out to talk to your guests to kind of keep them relaxed? I... I... <laughs> And then the lawyer immediately, you know, sublets the task off to uh, Karen and Foggy. So the whole legal team is here to basically pass a message along. Um, Matt's, Matt uses the excuse, the excitement is getting me down. And he, it's an excuse to change into Daredevil. But like, at this point, Foggy's got to think he's the biggest pussy in the world. I mean, yeah. And then um, Stan reminds you that uh, Daredevil's blind as the sure. sightless man makes a quick change. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Only to find a a runaway uh, truck of Hydra coming in with some kind of vortex bomb. Yeah, whatever the hell that is. Yeah. And I then like, uh, Hydra is all wearing red armbands at this point, too. I, I for I don't know. Maybe they were they were all doing that during that period. But yeah. And they're all in crappy green costumes. And sure. then. uh you know, and then Daredevil jumps into a car, which is probably a bad idea for a man that can't see. Yes, definitely. Um, well, I mean, he's he's really anxious because he doesn't want them to cheat him out of wedding cake. That's true. Yeah. He really wants that piece of wedding cake. And then, uh, just to add to how gratuitous it is, uh, the next panel is just, it's Iron Man, Quicksilver, and Captain America. Right. There's, there's no waiting. And then we get to one of my favorite uh, sequences where... Uh, what was this? That Cobra? Yep. Yeah, cobra. The, co- the Cobra uh, wraps, wraps around Cap as one of the most unintentionally funny bits of just the executioner slowly walking around the corner going, Captain America! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How'd you get here? <laughs> you know, like, you were invited too? And I like how Cap then uses Cobra to kind of slam into the executioner who's, who's like, woof. And Cap's insult, you shouldn't announce your attack, my pug ugly friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then they just throw the Enchantress in at this point because they're like, fuck it. Like, yeah. she's there too. And then <laughs> followed by, um, was it a. Uh, Mr. Hyde. Yeah, Mr. Hyde. He's just like, uh, you, you know, he was in the shadows for whatever reason. But don't worry, Hawkeye's coming to stop Mr. Hyde. Right? Who. Who then falls threat to a falling safe. Yeah, a falling safe <laughs> that um, is caught by uh, a uh, Steve Dicko Spider-Man off the cover of Amazing Spider-Man 19 cropped into the panel. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, there, there is some funny. Uh, yes, there's absolutely some funny stuff going on. <laughs> I, I love I mean so you 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 get a full blown battle. We get the Black Knight, the X Men come back into the picture, uh the Mandarin who's drawn very peculiar. <laughs> yeah, I, I do not get what they were doing there. But yeah, there is um keep in mind, there there's the X Men show up for like at least a quarter of, yeah. of the pages in this book, and they were not even remotely popular. No. Not they a were, yeah. No, definitely not. Um, and they're drawn. I mean, again, this is where poor Kirby's works getting butchered pretty aggressively. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and we, I mean, we we pulled by the time the smoke clears, almost every superpowered combatant in the area has heard the explosion, and we have a full blown it's clobber in time battle. Uh, and the big worry the breed has is we we they can't get to the Baxter building where Sue and Alicia are. Yeah. Not sure why that's the biggest concern in the world but you know why not it's it's also a little weird that um there's so much x-men without like a single like x-men villain really right yeah they, but, uh, the device twitter doesn't work on magneto or the brotherhood of evil mutants but um yeah the, but the beetle showed up yeah well and, i mean he's, yeah. he's a troll he's a he's always been <laughs> an electro so we got like a spider-man villain something yeah. You don't, you don't want to overdo it on the uh, on the Spider Man villains because Spider Man at this time was popular, right? Right. So 
they they have a big fight. Atuma shows up just to, I mean, why not? I mean, we're we're just apparently we get a little note here that uh, the emotion impulse never reached Prince Namor because he was too far below the surface on a fantastic quest. But Atuma was apparently hanging out, getting some sun, and he throws on his uh, kind of monster bunny hat and then taught you know gets the multicolored uh, Atlanta ships and decides to join this whole battle. Yeah, as uh, Quicksilver is just murdering the human top. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, <laughs> like just punching him till he's pro- he probably died. Yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> we just, I mean, just rendered in kind of sketchy lines, and it's got to be a neck crack at that point, and uh, <laughs> and everything else. Uh, but then we get to, I think, the weirdest point in the comic, which is Reed's called away by a voice as though from another world. And in comes uh, the Watcher, and we get we get this incredibly bizarre panel of <laughs> imploding. What what is the what is going on here? This was um, this was a thing that Kirby started to do because he was overworked. Where um, one page in like every Fantastic Four issue after a while was just like a photo. Yeah, <laughs> and then they would like crop uh, a little bit of illustration over it. So it's just this bizarre, nonsensical photo. Uh, in black and white that he just like drew on a separate piece of smaller paper uh, Reed and the watcher and just put it over it. It it makes no sense. Uh, According to the comic, this is a a picture from uh, a journey through the fourth dimension. I don't think that's true. No, I don't think so. uh, But, but no. And, um, and this is weird stupid fat baby watcher that we had briefly right he's he's got a diaper slash toga and i love this bit where he's like i am the watcher i can't do anything i'm not prevent i can't interfere but i will let you like just wander around my museum of weapons and if you see something you like you can can go ahead and take it home with you it's fine i'm i can't interfere but if you want to take my guns it's it that's that's on you i'm just gonna sit here (laughs) it's so bizarre because um, they basically have to stop every other villain in the Marvel universe in like a page and a half, <laughs> which they, they, they put in the anti Twitter device, which is a time displacer, which transport, it sucks everybody in like a, like a Roomba and then sends them, it erases their memory of what just happened and just off they go and, you know, off to do evil another time. It easily dispatches Kang the Conqueror, just just yeah. so everyone knows, and Enchantress, like some really heavy hitters. Yeah, and but but Kang really doesn't do anything in this comic. I, I think, did he do, I mean, we saw him briefly kind of moping about, and then we see him getting sucked in, and that's that's all the Kang we really got. Yeah, um, the uh, the Red Ghost gets way more page real estate. Yeah, he does. <laughs> but thankfully it does the trick thing is celebrating by giving uh Reed a piggyback ride, which makes sense. And they, and they get married. They get, they get married in a uh, one page, uh, yep. the whole wedding, um, which it's, it's really nice that uh professor X is standing up during the wedding. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate that too. He's, he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's up. I think that we get a little bit of Jean Grey in there. Uh, thing yeah. is blowing his nose, and then we get our our chaser at the very end of this comic. We had two gate crashers who are turned away by Dum Dum Duggan and Nick Fury, and yeah. we don't see their faces, but it's Stan and Jack. Yeah, and uh, so so we get a little bit of uh, that fourth wall break in, in a comic. Um, you know, this is before Grant Morrison's Animal Man. Uh, yeah. I just want to make sure everyone's clear on that. Uh, invitation, sir. Um, I should be on that list. Name? Stan Lee. Yeah, uh, nice try, buddy. Nice no, no, try. really, nice I'm try. Stan yeah. Lee. Yeah. Um, although, um, y- you know, if you want to feel like fucking garbage, <laughs> um, this Fantastic Four annual number three is closer to Grant's last issue of Animal Man than Grant's last issue of Animal Man, Animal Man is to us now. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
God damn it. Okay, well, that does wrap up the issue. Um, wow, thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no problem. But, um, but yeah, that that wraps this this issue up. But I, there, there's some really big takeaways from this, though. There are there, and it's yeah. There, there, there's a lot to go into now with this comic. Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things for me is um, it makes you want to reevaluate how we break up eras of comics because yeah. it's, a, it's a disservice to lump all of the silver age together because this is actually the first time ever in Marvel or, or any major comics company to this point to have this many characters in one issue. Right. You know, they normally like you would have crossovers, but the crossovers were always one, maybe two tops like it might be hulk when he's not in the avengers being chased down by the avengers and spider-man or something like that right this this is a, a whole new ball game yes you're right Reed. considering all that has happened here tonight i'll take what i can get i'm going to enjoy killing you very much <laughs> So another takeaway. So we, we we talked about what the the other thing in here is is um, we talk uh, uh, comics have this reputation for nothing sticking and nothing lasting and anything else. And this was a comic in the '60s where we had Reed and Sue get married, which was very much a backup part of the whole comic. Yeah, they um, teased it for like what, like seven months. Like it was it was a long time. They they teased that it was going to happen. It was, and the wedding, the the actual wedding is kind of it's two panels on the last page yes and that's it and it, it and it did have a lot of other things going on but two panels on the last page and then this wedding has actually stuck like they haven't erased this in the last 60 years yeah not only is it stuck but i mean for geez i, I mean not only did they have kids and, um, you know, uh, Franklin has at least stuck that whole time. Yeah. Um, you had for, for years after the wedding, they, they're constantly referencing the fact that they're married. I, I mean, a lot of it's aged really poorly. Sure. Like a lot of it is Sue being like, now that I'm a married woman, I have to make a roast for Reed. <laughs> yes. Like, yes. uh, it's, it happens all the time and, and they would have these like weird, like petty fights about not spending enough time with each other. Yeah, it was, it's very, it was, it's weird. Cause it's such a fifties, like early fifties throwback of a relationship that goes on. Like I, I was, I thought, oh, they got out of this mode in the early sixties, but it like, even in the seventies, they were doing pretty cringy stuff around like Sue's like, oh, I have to get my hair right or Reed will be mad. So, yeah, a, a lot of it. Um, yeah, because over the summer, I, I binged like the first 60 issues of Fantastic Four or so. And um, yeah, so much after the wedding is is exactly that. It's like, it, you know, Sue at the beauty parlor, like being like, please make sure that you, you make my hair as, as nice for Reed as possible. <laughs> it's just stuff like that. <laughs> it's It's a trip. Oh, it is. And it, it's funny because then the other part of the joke is Reed doesn't notice any of this. Like he's just <laughs> in his lab. So she's it's it's she's uh, trying to conform to some 1950s weird idealistic marriage that isn't even I mean, it, and the husband is clueless and doesn't know what's going on. It's it's a it is very, very strange. Like Sue for a good 10, 15 years is a very, very odd character. Yeah, and like every once in a while, Reed will just say something like egregious. Like he'll yeah. just be like, "No one was expecting you to do well at that, honey. You're flawed, like all women." Like, <laughs> like he would just like say these kind of crazy lines that would just sh pop up sporadically. But, yeah. but uh, one of the more positive things that that came out of all this, and, and, and this is where uh, I think using terms like silver age and bronze age and all of that uh, don't do comics justice 
Right. Uh, because even though this was uh, the end of 1965, this was, uh, I think, about eight months before DC would do something similar with the wedding of Elastigirl and Mentolo in uh, Doom Patrol 104 when uh, Madame Rouge would try to ruin that one. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, and, and this was also... <laughs> Oddly enough, the same month as Adventure Comics 337, which was another marriage issue. Yeah. Uh, funny how that works. But <laughs> um, <laughs> what, one of the interesting things that you can take from this is this was like the start of the new uh, Marvel Silver Age, really. Because, I agree, yeah. Yeah, because if you read the a lot of what Marvel was doing before this... It, it's not that different from what DC was doing. It really isn't. <laughs> like, I, I think we've romanticized this idea that Marvel was, like, way ahead and, and DC was still, like, figuring out what comics were. And that's just not the case. No, not at all. And, in fact, um, I, I believe you brought it up when we were talking about this issue. This exact same month, there was a, and this is just coincidence, there was a marriage going on in Legion of Superheroes. Yeah, it was. Um, it ended up being like a fake sort of thing. Like we had to get married to, you yeah. know, trick you know Dynamo Boy or something stupid. <laughs> but like, you, you know, it was it it was a gimmick. And but this one right. stuck. And and this is part of why I'm saying this is the true start of, of Marvel Silver Age. Is not only did they do something like this wedding and it stuck. Um, and not only did they like really show off just how deep their bench was uh, by a lot. Uh, there was never a comic with anything close to this many characters in it to really like, you know, uh, flaunt the, all of the all the IP they had. It, you also had right after this, uh, the Fantastic Four go into a, a pretty mature area because you had the Inhumans uh, right. were introduced immediately after this. Y you had, um, I think Gorgon was in the next issue. Um, we already had Medusa in the Frightful Four, but um, yeah, Gorgon and then the rest of the Inhumans right after this, which led right into um, the named in hindsight uh, Galactus trilogy. Right. You know, with the coming of Galactus and and all that, like it was a lot of big concept stuff. Uh, this was a mo this was a turning point. I, I completely agree with you. It, it definitely was a, a turning point. It was a uh, kind of broadening the the, the storylines. What's interesting about reading this comic is that, I mean, it, we talked about it while we were looking at it. It was it was really a lot of the the hero villain fights were were ultra simplistic. There wasn't a lot, there wasn't depth to any of this. It was just kind of a throw all the people on the page at once and then vacuum them away. And following this point, the comics do get certainly more complex and, and we get a lot more detail to the storytelling. And I, I, I think you're exactly right in terms of this, this was truly the beginning. Yeah, this was, um, and this was right before, the uh, the really famous Ditko uh, Spider Man that like trilogy with the um, that iconic uh, image of, of Spider Man um, on, with the water and, and all the wreckage around him. Um, yeah. that, that was right after this because um, what was it? That was God. Was that Amazing Spider Man three thirty one three thirty two three thirty three in that area? I think that's. I think that's right. Around where it was. Yeah. So, because this Spider-Man 29 would have just come out uh, this month. So, so you not only saw this maturing in Fantastic Four, it, it spread through the line. Because not only that, you had Spider-Man now dealing with the mortality of his aunt immediately after this. Right. Um and as soon as that was over, he he was like he was going into well, well it was that and he was like in college now, right? You, you know, like they shortly after that introduced Gwen Stacy and Harry Osborn and all of that. So so you saw two the two mainstays of the Marvel line at that point, Spider Man and Fantastic Four, um, notably matured after this issue. 
You did. And I think you could, you can even point to the same, I mean, to go through everything, you did see a slight evolution on the Avengers title. Although that was always a little bit different. The, the Hulk started being treated a little different. There, there's just, there was differences that was starting to move through all the comics. And I, I, this was kind of a, I mean, if you look at it from that angle, this comic feels like an ending. I mean, it was, it's a, it's a marriage, but it was also an ending. It was a chance to kind of bring everybody back on the page and have one kind of big slugfest type celebration that didn't necessarily make any, a lot of sense, kind of cartoonish. And it, it evolved into the next step of Marvel's life. Yeah. This was like a watershed moment. This was the end of an era in a lot of ways that unfortunately, because we divide everything into silver age, bronze age and all of that, I, I think in, you know, when we look back and, and, and do retrospectives on, on these sort of things that people uh, gloss over it because uh, to a lot of people, and, and it's not anyone's fault, it's just how people talk about the history of comics. It's like Fantastic Four number one came out and then Gwen Stacy died. Yeah. And, yeah. and you lose a lot if, if you look at comics that way. It, it does. I, I think that, um, no, no, it absolutely does. I mean, you're, you're, you're losing, God, how many, you're using like a decade of comics. That are, yeah. Like, it's like 14 years, 13 or 14 years. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. you're losing if, if you look at uh, uh, comics that way. Um, and it, you know, it's that it, you know, you have people who, you know, you look at it and I, I don't know. I, I feel like there, there's a lot of, People propping up Stan as being this master, uh, you know, comics professional uh, who completely changed everything. But mm -hmm. we don't talk enough about these like little these little moments that led to drastic changes at, at Marvel. Like I, I and how the first two were through the Fantastic Four, the Fantastic Four existing alone revolutionized the whole line and uh like four years later in this annual he revolutionized everything again yeah i i i i think you're absolutely right and um no it it it, it sorry my head's kind of spinning now the more i think about your theory um the more correct it is because if you look at at kind of the the fork in the road and so we've been we've been really gauging comics wrong um for the last 20 30 years in terms yeah. of when the eras began, this 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 comic, I mean, hugely significant, obviously for the storyline reasons of the of the wedding and and all the rest. Not not really hugely significant for Doctor Doom building a Twitter machine to make all the villains mad, but <laughs> um, but but in terms of what it meant for comics, um, this was this was one of those moments where we got into a completely different cycle of storytelling right after this. Interesting. Yeah, but you, you know it's. It, it is, and, and it's it, it's making me want to think of some of these other sort of moments. Because I mean, you could do the same thing going to the Bronze Age. You know, obviously, you know, you have the death of Gwen Stacy, but uh, I mean, you could then like I feel like you know, Dare like Frank Miller and Daredevil alone is is almost like a new um, era. You, you know. Um, it, it was close enough to Claremont taking over X-Men within like two years, you know, but like, I, again, it's like all these, these things, but like, I, I mean, giant size X-Men number one, isn't really what, what did it. I, it, it was a little bit further in that cemented the X-Men, you know, it's, oh, yeah. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a lot to think about. <laughs> People do. I, I think so. You're, you're bringing up a great point. I think there was um, that we get kind of fixated on certain landmark issues that aren't really the the change agents that I think we think are like like that giant size X Men number one. It was it was a good ten issues after that before things, or maybe even a little bit more than that, before things really started to change. And and the same thing with this. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, even just kind of now, I'm looking at some of the comics that were coming out during that time. Um, you know, Captain Marvel and and some of the books that, that were out during the, this this late sixties time frame. Uh, what they were were doing with Thor actually did get to be um, quite a bit different, um, including kind of that that meet up with Galactus toward the end of the sixties. Uh, yeah, there there was a, there was a lot here. Silver Surfer coming in, obviously through the Fantastic Four, but then also what they would do with with that character. It's um, 
it, it was a change. And I think like, like you said, in the mid seventies, probably late seventies, you got it. You got that other change with daredevil and, and some of those books as well. So. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and silver surfer, I mean, a lot of people have commented on uh silver surfer sort of al- almost being this like uh nihilistic teen from the mm-hmm. 60s kind of um, character. Um, I, I'd really have to do more of a deep dive into the history to know if that's like something that was really thought of at the time, or if that's something that people kind of latched onto after the fact. It, it, that feels like a revisionist history kind of thing, yeah. you know, just kind of how we look at it you know, through hind, through through other eyes. But there definitely was a maturity here, and um, and it's weird to say that in the midst of this shenanigans book of, of a lot of silliness, like we pointed out, but. I don't know. So all things considered, though, is this like is this one of your favorite books or like how I think you you, you answered the question already. This this is a major comic for Marvel. Yeah. Uh, anyone who likes Marvel comics needs to read this, yeah. um, you, you know, and this is also I a few issues before this. Like, like if you if you love Fantastic Four starting a little before this when the frightful four turned uh the thing against uh the fantastic four if you start there and work through all all that through like issue 60 it's some of the best fantastic four you're ever going to read in your whole life yeah i i agree i I mean i i liked what hickman did later i loved burns era of the fantastic four as well um a lot of people skip to a lot of people for a long time it was burn and then it's now burn and hickman is kind of the the era um, but this this run, um, which was Stan Lee, uh, was a great run of Fantastic Four. Yeah, uh, one of if if not the best. Um, you, you know, sure we don't get the horrifying, difficult to look at, jagged rock thing that Tom DeFalco gave us. <laughs> but um, but you know, we uh, there, there's enough horrifying things in this. There's obviously that really important. Uh, one shot uh, thing issue, um, which I think was was that fifty one, right after the anniversary issue. So this would be fifty one or fifty two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. Obviously, that one's a, a, a big deal. Um, yeah, like there's you know we have uh, you know first Black Panther coming up uh, after this. Like it's really a big maturing of the line that you can trace back to this annual and the wedding of uh, Reed and Sue. And I think this, this is probably, I mean, I think it's fair to say this was Stan Lee's best at Marvel, wasn't it during this era? Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah. This and, and Spider-Man really hit its stride mm-hmm. uh, right around here. Some of the best Spider-Man issues you're, you're ever going to read in your life also happen right around here. Um, yeah. And, and I don't think Stan really, gets quite as good on Spider-Man again after Ditko leaves till shortly before he leaves the book entirely. Um, he, yep. he picks it up again and then Roy Thomas takes over for a bit and then he does a few more good issues and then he creates the, the gibbon. <laughs> well, he went out on the gibbon on Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, have mic, you gotta have that mic drop. And what what better way to do it than with the Gibbon? Um, it, it's an amazing comic. Uh, I love. We were th- we actually said this was going to be a short one, and I think we're going to wind up going about an hour still. But it's uh, yeah, I, it's th- this is a hugely important comic, and and like you said, I, I think everybody should. If you're a Marvel fan, you got to pick it up. You got to read it at some point. Definitely, if you're a Fantastic Four fan. But I think if you're a Marvel fan, this is one of those comics you can pick up. And it really cements kind of a change of an era, and so it's it's yeah. it's important to, to read. It's really important. Um, I'm sure you know, like you can since the the comic came out um, within three months, you can read it on Marvel Unlimited. Yeah, that's right. It is uh, there. It's it's been out for at least three months. But um, okay. you know, beyond that, I mean, go on Comicsology or um, the uh, next year is the 60th anniversary of the Fantastic Four. Yeah. Uh and they're re-releasing uh or reissuing rather the first three Fantastic Four omnibuses by Stanley, Jack Kirby, and finally giving us 
the fourth omnibus, which will round out all the rest of the Stan and, and Jack stuff. So uh, by there. That's, yeah. Yeah. If, if you've been waiting, next year's your year to just gobble up all of Fantastic Four like Galactus would. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Eat yeah. that. Eat that planet. Eat that comic. Um, well, Joe, thank you very much. This is awesome. And uh, and yeah, bring back good memories of uh, a great comic. Obviously, I wasn't alive when this came out, but uh, not that. No, old. no, I, I, I wasn't either. But uh, <laughs> hey, great, great stuff. Um, you know, this issue, um, I I am further away from when I was born. Than oh, when no, I not this again. <laughs> Don't do this. Don't do this. Oh, it's 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 so painful. Uh, <laughs> it really is. <laughs> it is great comics. I recommend everybody check it out. Joe, well, let's. Uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna meet up again and do this uh, this comic that is gonna make everybody mad. Yeah, you know, maybe we'll do it. Ju- Who knows? Maybe it'll be just in time for Christmas. <laughs> no, it's that's our Christmas present for everybody. That's, yes, that that'll be our Christmas present. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, and I hope you all enjoy. Absolutely.